Next up is, is Nathan Anderson from the Smithsonian Institution, uh, Item Driven Image Fidelity, IDIF, uh, hitting the digital capture sweet spot. Uh, Nathan Anderson, Nathan Ian Anderson, is a cultural heritage professional with over 20 years of expertise as a lead imaging specialist and project manager involved specifically with digitization and information technology. For the past eight years at the Smithsonian Institution, he has been a photographer and a program officer in the digital preservation, and I'm sorry, in the digitization program office. Uh, he is responsible for overseeing the digitization of roughly half a million objects within his first two years at Cooper Hewitt Design Museum and the National Museum of Natural History. He is no stranger to working with varied collections from rare Tiffany vases to 30 million year old fossils. Nathan, it's all yours. Thanks, and uh, thanks for having me here. Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Nathan, and uh, I've been working for the Smithsonian for a number of years, and I, I come to the Smithsonian from a uh, fine arts background, I'm a photographer, and I worked for a number of years in New York City at an art gallery, and uh, now find myself on the cultural heritage side of things. So I'm no stranger to working with images and trying to find the best way to capture objects. And so what I'm going to be talking to you all about is how do we determine what are the criteria and what are the resolution requirements that we bring to any project that we do. Um, so to that end, I wanted to talk first just about my department at the Smithsonian. It's a little bit unique in the sense that the Smithsonian being such a large organization, we have an embedded digitization program office that's located within the office of the chief information officer called OCIO. It's sort of the IT side of the Smithsonian. And we have within our office uh, a few different um, departments that address different sides of the digitization uh, uh, agenda. We have uh, mass digitization, we have informatics, the 3D digitization side, and we also look at policy and analysis. Um, I originally started in the mass digitization portion of the Smithsonian, but now I'm heading up a new team called Imaging Services, where we photograph at all the different museums across the institution where they need help uh, photographically. So it's a pretty cool job in that I get to work with every museum and a very, very you know, varied, uh, many different varied collections. But to that end, we have to figure out how are we going to photograph all these different collections and what is the best way to do it. Um, so here I just, I'm going to skip past that because that's a little bit about me, we, we already know. Um, so I want to talk about the first project that I started with at the Smithsonian, the Cooper Hewitt. And I came in and uh, was told, well, we are going to be photographing the entire museum and we're going to be doing it um, in about two years. And it's 193 objects. We have prints, drawings, graphic design, textiles, paintings, sculpture, everything under the gamut. And um, we ended up doing it in about 18 months. Uh, I worked with about three other photographers and 16 art handlers in two locations with six sets going simultaneously. And I ran all of that. Um, after that, uh, we did uh, projects with the uh, American uh, History Museum where we photographed numismatic collection of um, currency sheets. We digitized around 276,000 of those in five months. And then most recently, we uh, completed the project with the botany department where we digitized over 3.8 million specimens. And we did that with about 3,500 specimens daily that we were doing. And that was being uh, done on a conveyor-based system. So that's how we were able to achieve those numbers. So when we look at all of these different kinds of projects, um, you can see that there's lots of different problems and different inherent challenges to the very different kinds of things that we're working with. And the biggest thing isn't necessarily just how am I going to do it, it's going to be how, where are we going to save all this stuff? How are we going to figure out what that means? Um, for all those three projects, it ended up generating up 1.4 petabytes of data. That's a lot of data. And if I were to go in and say, okay, we're just going to shoot all of this with the highest megapixel camera that's on the market, and um, that's just what you know we, we should do, right? That's what everybody uses, is the highest resolution. Well, that might not necessarily be the right 
answer to that question because that's just going to make our data use go way through the roof. And to be honest, what we have to determine is maybe a higher resolution isn't necessary, isn't necessary for some objects and it might be not enough for others. So how do we determine what that is? Um, so really, it's the dilemma that we all face. Um, I don't want to go back and reshoot that whole botany collection in, an, in 10 years when the 500 megapixel camera comes out or the 1000 megapixel camera comes out because that would be nuts. That would be another 3.8 million specimens. That was a lot of money and a lot of time. So we really have to make sure that the resolution that we're using when we do these projects um, stands the test of time and is the right resolution for the right object. So we look at what is that sweet spot and in the case of what we've determined in my office, what that is, is it's this process that we call IDIF, which is item-driven image fidelity. Now, we have guidelines already for a lot of 2D art with Faji, um, and you know, those work great, but they don't always work for when you're shooting a natural history collection you know, in paleo, uh, paleo bio or a botanical specimen. So how do you figure out what's the resolution for this? What is, what is the camera system I'm going to bring to this project? So we work first by identifying what's the smallest item or resolvable uh, detail we want to get out of an object. So I work with curators and the collection managers to determine what do they want to get out of this image when we leave the project. I mean, is it being used for research? Is it being used for reproduction? If it's just a reproduction requirement, then we're looking at you know, the standard, well, we want it to be 300 uh, PPI at 8 by 10 or something. But that's meaningless to me. I, I don't, that doesn't help a, a researcher go beyond that resolution. So um, we go and we look at the smallest detail, and we measure what that is. And that helps us determine what the resolution is going to be for that uh, given collection. So, this presentation today is going to be sort of a, a, a few different projects I've worked on across the Smithsonian and, and what that is. In particular, I'm using this paleo bio illustration. Um, so, you know, the smallest specimen we ended up identifying was in this vial, and it was this little bivalve clam. And it was really tiny, and we, the curators were telling us that we really want to be able to see these little hinge lines along the, uh, the clam. And, I'm like, okay, well, what, what is that exactly? So they told me, um, you know, it's called taxodentic teeth. Um, we're getting really technical here, but, you know, that's what I love about my job is I'm able to work with all of these, you know, um, scientists and art historians, and they all tell me what is the pertinent thing here. Um, so for bivalve uh, morphology, that's what we needed to measure. So we measured it, but before we get into measuring it, we have to d talk about what is resolvable detail? Like, what is a, a resolvable uh, smallest detail in an image? And in the case of, of what we've determined is that we like to use something that we call the, the rally criterion. And it's a sort of a fancy word, but it's actually, it was originally formulated for determining the resolution of two-dimensional telescopic imagery. Um, and it's wherein two objects appear distinct from each other uh, through the resolution, whereas if they're too close to each other, they could be uh, appearing as one. So when you're looking at a, um, a micron measurement of an object, we're looking at measuring the space between things. And then when that ends up being photographed or digitized, we have an idea of what that, um, that resolution is going to be. So we use a, a micron um, microscope to measure the distance between the smallest detail. And I'm just going to give a shout out to an old colleague of mine, Ben Sullivan, who's here in the audience, who helped build this little uh, wooden microscope uh, holder for our iPhones. So I'll go to a project and I'll bring my microscope, uh, my micron microscope and my iPhone, and I can start measuring the collection. I can start seeing, you know, how, um, what is that resolution going to be? Um, and uh, using this uh, micron microscope, uh, in this slide, you can see that there's a, a half-tone dot that I'm showing as an example. And one division would be about 10 microns. Uh, for size comparison, a blood cell is about 5 microns across. All right? So we're looking at a very, very small size um, in terms of determining what the resolution is going to be.
uh, for the case of what we did here with uh, PaleoBio, I measured the space between on these little, this little hinge plate of a clam. And I was like, okay, that, that's, that's my result. But what does that end up being? So I measured that there was actually, um, well, I gotta look at my notes here. It was, um, hold on. Okay, it was 80 microns that I measured in that image. Okay, it's hard for me to see it from my screen. So 80 microns, that measures to around 317 uh, SFR. So we know how many microns are in an inch, okay? There's 25,400 microns in an inch. So my micron measurement of 80 divided by that 25,400 gets me 317 uh, spatial frequency response, or PPI, okay? Uh, I know I'm getting really technical with some of you guys, but hopefully these slides will be available for anyone after the presentation and you can look at this or get in touch with me with the math. But um, that's giving me a, a resolvable PPI measurement that I would need to take a picture of at that resolution to get that smallest detail, okay? Um, that's what the resolution would be. But hold everything. We have to consider something we call phase correction with digital imaging. In other words, it's where uh, pixel elements don't align perfectly with the physical detail. To do that, we apply a little bit of a multiplier, and then I have a new calculation of around 476 ppi, which would be the optimal resolution to photograph that particular um, collection of, of, of um, bivalves. So, at the end of the day, this is that image taken with a 100% um, magnification, shot at 476 ppi, and you can see when I blow it up to 100%, there's those little teeth. Now, I'm not able to go into those little um, you know, teeth on the clam, but it's good enough for a scientist who's half a world away to do species identification based off of that image. And again, this is very small, clam that we're looking at in that little vial in that huge uh, subset of different fossilized bivalves. So that's a sort of an example of how we work with paleontology, but there's lots of other kinds of different collections I work with across the Smithsonian, and that resolution isn't going to work for everything. It's only going to work for that collection. And we have to be really careful when we do this because I'm contracting with a vendor and I'm asking them to come in and photograph this entire project based off of that criteria. So we, that's why we do all of this extensive sort of analytical specifications for what we're working with. Um, here's some other examples of some collections I've worked with, and they're kind of appropriate based off of what Jan was just telling us about his requirements to get those high resolution color images, is that, you know, he would be the subject matter expert that I would go to to ask him, what do we need to, you know, measure to resolve to? Um, but working with uh, the Smithsonian Museum of African Art, we were doing a, a postcard collection, and um, I was measuring the, the half tones for the, um, that one, and we had different kinds of, of postcards. There were rotor gravures, but everything was kind of coming out at around 30 microns. We also had um, collotypes and silver gelatin. Obviously, silver gelatin is gonna have the tightest grain pattern, so it's going to be a higher resolution, but still, it's around 20 to 30 microns across, so that, in turn, indicates what I'm going to end up photographing the rest of the collection at. In this case, uh, the smallest measurement, which was 30, going through all of my math, I ended up getting an optimal resolution of 1,280 ppi. All right, so that helps us know what we should be photographing that collection at. That botany collection that I mentioned before with the conveyor, um, again, we were doing 3.8 million specimens. We have to be very careful about what kind of camera we're bringing. So we worked with the, um, the fern curator in the NMNH botany department, and he said, all right, well, you know, the spores on the fern sheets are what we want to resolve down to for our research purposes. So we measured those, and those are 42 microns across for a spore of a fern. And then that ended up becoming around 603 ppi. So for that, we were like, okay, we feel pretty comfortable going into this project with a 100 megapixel camera, and that ended up being the right camera for the field of view and the imaging window that we were using. So obviously, 
you get your, your base idea of what your PPI is, and then you have to look at what is the actual object, you know, in terms of the, the limitations we have with sensor size, and then with the two, we figure out what's the best camera that we're going to bring to a project. Um, another fun project I did was with Smithsonian Gardens, where it's a living collection, and we measured the hairs of these uh, orchid plants, and we needed to know, all right, well, what's that going to be? And that was about 60 microns across, so that was 635 PPI. Um, I know I'm giving you a lot of examples here, but I, I love doing this stuff. It's a lot of fun. So it's the best part of my job is working with all of these varied collections. Um, the National Postal Museum, we looked at the engraving lines on the, um, what the stamps had as a engraving lines. You could also look at, for example, um, perhaps the brush strokes on a painting, measuring them how wide a brush stroke is, and that would end up getting you your um, resolution for what you're trying to resolve to for when you photograph a piece. For a physical collection, um, I think my last example here is of the um, castle collection. This is a case where I didn't use that Micron um, iPhone situation. I just used a, a pair of digital calipers, Micron calipers, and I was getting a much higher Micron measurement because we're looking at much larger things. We're not looking at the halftone dot. We're looking at punch marks on a chair or the thread and stitching of the back of the chair or the pressed wood in this example. But, you know, that ended up being 69 PPI for the resolvable level of detail for the thread. Um, but we still have to figure on depth of field, everything else that we're going to bring into the picture. So we ended up going to 100 PPI for that. And then there's a detail of the image. We ended up using, I think, a 100 megapixel camera for this, just based on all of our depth of field requirements that we had. We had to be far enough back to be able to crop in. And then after we did, we were able to get that resolution. Um, some things, obviously, are standard that we're, you know, we don't have to worry too much about. We know that um, there's already widely accepted metrics on film grain relative to sharpness. Um, those have been measured and documented, but I just want to give an example of why we use those measurements uh, in photography. And in this, a 35 millimeter slide scanned at 4800 PPI is the ideal resolution that you would want to be able to get the grain structure that's inherent to the slide or to the negative in this case. So thank you. And uh, some more further reading if you want to look into that. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, do we have any questions? Doug? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Anything virtually? Chris. Chris Randrock. All right. Uh, I don't know if I want to take a question from Kurt. It's going to be too technical. <laughs> yes, we do have a virtual question. Are you creating a database of all your PPI choices in order to inform future project specifications without the need to use micron reading tools every time? That's a great question. And to answer your question, yes, we, we are. Um, and it's something that, you know, as we do all these different kinds of varied collections across the Smithsonian, we're continuing to build that database. And then presenting at conferences like this, we're kind of letting everybody know why we do what we do. And eventually, we can make those available uh, through our website at uh, dpo.si.edu. And you could go on there and get like a list of what it would be to, for when you want to photograph your, your own vintage chairs and what that's going to be like. <laughs> Kurt, what's your question? Well, this one thing, but uh, another one, uh, when you're dealing with a three-dimensional object, how do you define PPI? Because the back will have a different PPI than the front. Well, perspective. Right. So I would go with what the smallest detail is on the front. Um, you know, for those chair images, we're looking at the we're not looking at the pores of the wood. You know, that would be overkill. Um, that would be oversampling. And the curators didn't want to know that. They just wanted to know like the thread. They wanted to be able to see that. And so if I measure the thread and I get my PPI the highest it would be for what's in the foreground, even if it goes soft in the back, that's, that's OK, you know. Any more virtual questions? One more virtual question. For phase correction, factoring of 1.5, not 2, or any other number, just a general explanation of those factoring numbers and why they're selected or not selected. <laughs> 
So phase correction, um, what we were finding when we did our resolvable detail, resolvable meant you could see what something was, but it wasn't high enough sometimes to get something beyond resolvable. Like again, the resolvable detail based off of that Riley criterion is, is a little fuzzy, you know, it's being used for uh, telescopic imagery. So sometimes for reproduction level imagery, we have to look at the phase correction. Um, and before I figured out what that was, I went to Don Williams, who we all know, and I asked him, and I proposed this to him, what would be the optimal phase correction? Don Williams is the creator of um, image targets that we all work with in the cultural heritage. And uh, he said 1.5 would be the sweet spot. You go higher than that and you're getting excessive. Um, so that's where we kind of ended up at. And I have a question. Um, you, you talked a bit about um, discussing research requirements from curators and so forth. Did you do any um, historical um, data from, has, in other words, has the researcher's requirements changed over time or is that just flat? It hasn't really changed. Um, there's always going to be cases, especially with something like a paleo bio specimens, a specimen where they're using the imagery for uh, taxonomic identification um, based off of like what species is it but if we're actually looking at say uh, anything more than that they're probably still going to want to go to the physical collection and look at that under a microscope but this eliminates that first step of them identifying what they want to look at under the microscope um, so typically the research that most of these folks are doing is specific to identification or taxonomic identification Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, all right, perfect. Thank you. Yeah.